Hello, welcome to Big Picture Monday. My name is Callie Black and I'm so excited to talk about the story version of what's going on in this week's Come Follow Me reading. That way when you read the scriptures, you don't have to worry so much about the comprehension side of it and you can instead focus on what matters most, which is of course listening to the spirit and listening to those promptings instead of trying to figure out okay what's actually going on here <laughs> this week i am so excited as i mentioned because we are studying two separate stories and they are truly like two of my favorite stories in all of the old testament and i'm psyched we get to study both of them this week we are studying the book of ruth the whole thing which is four chapters which are each very very short so very short four chapters in the book of ruth and then we're going to read the first three chapters in the book of 1 Samuel. So 1 Samuel 1 through 3. Um, and they are two very distinct stories, and I'm excited to talk about both of them today. Now, context-wise, we are still in the time of the Judges. If you missed my video last week when we were in the book of Judges, make sure to watch that because you're going to want to know about the Judges, why it's Judges. You're also going to want to know what a Nazarite is when I talked about Samson. So make sure to watch last week's video if you missed that. Um, but we're in the time of the judges, remember? So all the tribes are really disjointed. They're just kind of doing their own thing. They're still getting attacked by outside forces at various points in times, but they would just attack like, oh, just the tribe of Judah or, oh, just the tribe of Ephraim or whatever it is. And other tribes would go and help them and assist them. It's not like they were totally on their own, but, um, for the most part, they're not united under one rule. There is just one place that the tabernacle is that the priests work at. Um, and so everyone just travels to wherever the tabernacle is one time a year to, to worship at the tabernacle. And then they go back to their own place and that's where they live their lives. Um, the story of Ruth, the book of Ruth that we read, happens during the time of the judges. So this happens during everything that we were talking about last week. We don't have an exact time period because they don't mention a judge or anything specific to like timestamp this exactly, but most people believe it is towards the end of the time period of the judges. Um, but just to get you kind of in the right frame of mind, like Ruth's story takes place during the time of the judges disjointed little tribes. Now, the story starts with a family in um, Bethlehem. Bethlehem is where the tribe of Judah is. Now, Bethlehem is not a famous city yet for the reasons you're probably thinking of now, right? This is way before Christ's birth, um, but it is in the tribe of Judah. There was a guy named Eli Malek and his wife, uh, Naomi. They lived there in Bethlehem, enjoying their time until a huge famine hits the land. And it gets to the point where you know, Eli Malek is like, I've got to get my family out of here. We cannot survive. We cannot survive here in Bethlehem. And so they decide to go to Moab. They literally leave, you know, all of the tribes of Israel. They're going to Moab. We've talked about Moab before as a place that's trying to defeat Israel. Um, but of course, relations between different places are changing all the time. So at this point in time, the Moabites must have been fine with um, with people from the tribe of, of Judah coming towards them, especially in this time of famine. So um, this couple, they go to uh, Moab and they're there. And while they're there, they have two sons. And while they're there, the father dies as well. Ian Amalek dies. Now we've talked about this before when dads die. This is why the concept of a firstborn son is so important because women had no rights to property. They had no social standing on their own. And so if dad dies, the only way that mom's going to have anything is if her son then provides for her. So her two sons are doing a great job at providing for their mother, Naomi. Um, meanwhile, these two sons get married to women that they find there in Moab, that they date and marry in Moab. I don't know if they date. I don't really know. Um, anyways, they get married. Ten years have passed at this point and both of the sons die. Now, at this point, Naomi is like completely destitute when it comes to her social standing and her financial standing because now she doesn't have a husband and she doesn't have sons to support her. There's nothing for her. Like she is a forgotten member of society. And so she goes to her two daughters-in-law and says, okay, I'm actually going to go back to Bethlehem because I heard that the drought, the famine is kind of ending there. And so I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. Um, but you guys just stay here. Kind of like, forget this all happened. <laughs> you stay in Moab, go back to your families, because um, it's, it's a long journey back over to Bethlehem. And one of the daughters-in-law named Orpa, she says, okay, you know, she was still heartbroken by this, but she, she agreed that that was best, and she went back with her family. 
but the other daughter-in-law's name is Ruth and she refused to go back to to stay in Moab and she decided she was going to stay with Naomi. Now the Im implication here and this does not say it in the scriptures but it's it's the widely accepted implication here is that this means that Ruth had converted to believing the God of Israel. In Moab that was not a thing it was it's just the children of Israel who know about the Lord their God and so um, Ruth would not have been raised with that knowledge but now that she's staying with Naomi and she's returning back to Bethlehem that means that she had to have converted um, to believing the God of Israel as well and and wanting to partake in the covenant of Israel so that is implied so Ruth and Naomi go back to Bethlehem. Okay, so chapter two, this is when they're in Bethlehem. Now, if you imagine the gates of a city, when we talk about um, someone standing at the gates of the city, this is like, you know, the main part of the city where the doors open, right? Um, but it also is like the social hub for the city um, and kind of the place where anyone would gather. Um, Naomi goes to the gate of the city. She seems to be older and not quite able to do everything that Ruth can. So Naomi goes to the gate of the city and tells Ruth, okay, can you go and glean whatever you can? Now, if you remember when we first learned about the law of Moses uh, back in Exodus, I think back to there on Mount Sinai, um, one of the things that the Lord revealed to Moses that he taught the children of Israel is that they shouldn't, when they're harvesting their crops, they shouldn't harvest the corners, like the far edges, corners of their fields so that the poorest individuals of society could come by and glean, take whatever they need um, out of their, you know, the abundance of someone who has their field. And so Ruth goes to do this. They're hungry, they need food. She goes to a field, she starts to glean some corn and some grain. Now, while she's doing this, she discovers that the owner of the field is this guy named Boaz. And she finds out Boaz is related to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and it's a relative. And so she meets Boaz and they kind of make this connection where Ruth is like, hey, actually, you're a relative of my mother-in-law. You know, here's how the connection goes. And Boaz just shows great mercy towards Ruth and says, come to my house. Let me feed you a proper meal. But then when Ruth says, hey, Naomi's out at the gates of the city, he says, okay, please glean as much as you want. Take anything that Naomi wants and go back out to her at the gates. Um, so chapter three, we see that Ruth goes back out to the gates of the city, finds Naomi, tells her, tells her like, you'll never guess whose field I started to clean from. It's Boaz and you know Boaz and it's all these connections that are being made. And you can tell Naomi all of a sudden gets this plan in her mind because she tells Ruth very specific directions. She says, you've, you've got to marry Boaz. And it wasn't just like the marriage that needed to happen, but when you married someone, you also took on, when you married a female, so a male marrying a female, they would also buy or inherit um, the father's property that he's giving to them. And if the father wasn't there, he would buy all of the father's land and possessions. So basically, this was a way for both Ruth and Naomi to have, to, to be kind of like bought out of this land that Eli Malek had, had left behind and they would be financially stable and socially stable. Like this was the answer to their prayers. So Ruth tells Naomi some, sorry, Naomi tells Ruth some very specific directions that seem kind of weird, but culturally they made sense. Pretty much she tells Ruth to go lay at the feet of Boaz and, and propose marriage. And Ruth does this. Ruth follows all of her directions. And Boaz is again, very kind, just he's a very kind and generous person. And he talks to Ruth and says, okay, I will marry you. And that's implied and also buy all of the land, you know, and, and get you and Naomi out of destitution here. But there is actually one kinsman who's a little bit closer in relation to you guys than I am. I need to go ask his permission first. And in the meantime, here's a whole bunch of food. Go take it to Na Naomi. Um, so Ruth goes off to take that to Naomi and tell her what's going on. So in chapter four, Boaz goes to the gates of the city and he finds this kinsman who is closer in relation to Naomi um, than he is. And he gathers a crowd around so that there's witnesses and he says, okay, would you like to marry Ruth and, and buy all of the property and take on that responsibility? And this other relation goes, nope, 
you got it. And Boaz says, okay, and like, we've got that on record here. Everyone saw that this happened above the table and, and it was all good. Um, and then it happens, Boaz marries Ruth, um, which also implies that financially they have been saved and um, they have all the land taken care of. And then they do eventually have a son who becomes um, one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ through his lineage, the Savior Jesus Christ is born as well. Isn't that a great story? I know the story of Ruth and Naomi. I've heard it plenty of times, but as I was reading through the scriptures, there are a few things that I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that like, shouldn't know that was Boaz's field at first or, you know, a bunch of details. So I hope that was kind of interesting to hear that retold. But as you read this book, look for the symbolism. It is fascinating to learn about specifically Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. I think they're all great examples at different points in time in the story. But what does this teach us about the Savior and our relationship to the Savior and the Savior's relationship to us? I think the like spiritual understory is fascinating in the book of Ruth as well. Okay, let's go to the second story. Second story is in 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 3. Now, the book of 1 Samuel, if you read it, um, we are at the very end of the judges period. Um, we are about to go into the next time period. After judges, the people wanted to turn to a king. Um, so that's where we're headed next. And the book of Samuel, the book of first Samuel tells that transition. In fact, I don't want to get like too much into this, but if you open up your scriptures to the book of first Samuel, you'll see there's a subtitle. And what's the subtitle? It says, also known as, or otherwise known as, the first book of the kings. And if you go to second Samuel, it'll say the second book of the kings. And then the next book is called first kings. And it'll say also known as the third book of the kings. And then if you go to the next book, which is called second kings, it says also known as the fourth book of the kings. I hope that's, you know, kind of blowing mind there with the numbers. But basically, these next four books, first Samuel, second Samuel, first kings, second kings, all tell the story of what happened when Israel then became united under the rule of one king, okay? So we're not there yet, but Samuel, who we're going to learn about this week, plays a very, very important role in this transition from judges to kings. So we're right here at the transition period. In chapters one through three, though, we are just getting the origin story of Samuel, um, at, which starts with his mom, Hannah, and she is awesome. So in chapter one, it, his mom Hannah we learn about her she is married to a guy named Elkanah and Elkanah uh Hannah cannot have kids she can't have kids Elkanah does have at least one other wife who does have kids um but Hannah is not able to have children now once a year they make their yearly trek to the tabernacle and the tabernacle is in a place called Shiloh at this point in time so they go to the tabernacle in Shiloh they offer up their sacrifices this happens every year well our story picks up with one of these times when Hannah and Elkanah I'm gonna keep forgetting his name when they travel to Shiloh um to worship at the tabernacle but this year in particular Hannah is just so heavy with this idea that she cannot bear children, especially when she's surrounded by women who are able to bear children. And so she goes to the tabernacle and she is just praying with her whole heart, her whole soul. She wants a child and she even goes to make a deal with the Lord and says, if you give me a son, I will raise him as a Nazarite. Make sure you watch last week's video talking about Samson to know what that means. I will raise him as a Nazarite. I will fully devote him to your cause, to the Lord. I, I will totally give him to you. Now, at the same time, there's a guy named Eli, and Eli is the high priest. He's the priest of the tabernacle there. And so he's working at the tabernacle, right? And he sees Hannah praying. But Hannah is so emotional um, and, and physical with the way that she's worshiping. Eli thinks Hannah is drunk. And so he goes over to Hannah to be like, hey, <laughs> You can't do that here in the tabernacle. Get out, please. And Hannah responds and says, I, I am not drunk. I am praying with my whole heart and soul to the Lord right now. And Eli kind of has this softening of the heart and realizing that he has made a mistake. And he is inspired to tell Hannah, whatever you're praying to the Lord about, he will answer your prayer. And sure enough, Hannah uh, becomes pregnant and she gives birth to a son named Samuel. Um, 
Samuel is raised as a Nazarite, and we know that after he was weaned, we've talked about this before, but that seems to be around three years of age in Old Testament times, but it says that after he was weaned, Hannah brought Samuel back to the tabernacle there in Shiloh and officially like dedicated him to the Lord. Now we don't know exactly what this looked like. Like, does that mean Eli, the high priest, then raised Samuel completely or was Hannah still involved? We're not sure exactly. But at that point in time, he was fully um, dedicated to the Lord and to the cause of the Lord. In chapter two, we start off with a beautiful song and prayer from Hannah. She is so grateful to the Lord. And we also find out that the Lord then blessed Hannah with more children um, after having Samuel and giving him up. So we know that Eli starts to raise Samuel, at least spiritually, he raises Samuel and teaches him everything about the tabernacle and how it works and how to function as a, as a priest and how to make that all happen. Um, and Eli, as, as the high priest of the tabernacle, his sons are helping to assist as well. They're priests in the tabernacle, but we find out his sons are not righteous and they're making some, some poor choices, committing sin. And Eli knows about this and is still allowing his sons to work in the tabernacle. And so the Lord talks to Eli and says, listen, because you're doing this, I'm going to need to pick a new high priest. I'm going to need to pick someone else to take over the role that you have because I'm not picking your sons and you've kind of lost this privilege because you've allowed sin to continue in my tabernacle. Um, and Eli seems to be pretty understanding of this. Like he understands that he has, has made poor decisions. Uh, and in chapter three of first Samuel, we then get the story. We don't know how old Samuel is at this point in time, um, but we get the story of Samuel sleeping and he's sleeping and he hears a voice calling out to him. And he's not sure who it is. Um, in fact, he thinks that it's Eli. He thinks, hey, Eli's calling out for me. And so he goes to Eli. Um, eventually, Eli starts to figure out what's going on. And Eli says, oh, Samuel, it's the Lord. The Lord's trying to talk to you right now. And you are not realizing that it's the Lord. And so he says, the next time that the Lord tries to call out to you, answer, here I am. And if you answer that, then the Lord will respond. And Samuel goes, okay. So Samuel goes back to sleep. And once again, he is awoken by this voice calling out his name. And so he decides to say, here I am. And the Lord responds. And the Lord has this conversation with Samuel, basically telling him what he told Eli earlier, that there needs to be a new priest, that Eli is not going to be able to continue. Um, and it definitely is not passing on to his sons as well. Um, and and kind of implying that Samuel is going to be the one to carry on this, this new role. And Samuel does tell Eli about what the Lord says, and Eli is not surprised. He already had that same conversation with the Lord, so he knew that that was coming. And we end chapter three with learning that Samuel is being called as a prophet for all of Israel. If you've been on my Instagram stories, we've been talking a lot about um, a prophet versus the prophet. Why are there so many prophets in ancient Israel? So I think it's good that there's to see this distinction here that Samuel is being called as the prophet for all of Israel. That makes it pretty clear um, what his jurisdiction is and what his um, duties are as opposed to other prophets that might be called up at other times. And that's where we end off this week. Don't worry, we will hear much more about Samuel in the future and we'll see how he plays a role in this transition that Israel makes from disjointed tribes with judges to unified, unified under the rule of a king because kings always work out really well, right? <laughs> okay, that's it for this week. Two fantastic stories. I especially love the examples of strong women we get to read about this week. I think that is fantastic. And in fact, my spiritual guiding question is going to be focused on Naomi. I think Naomi is like amazing. And one thing that I feel like she does is she does so many things that are selfless. So many things that are selfless, that are really almost a, a detriment to herself. And she is being very selfless. And so I want to think about how is Naomi being selfless? Um, and how can I be more selfless. There's a lot of selfishness in the world. There's a lot of selfishness in my life. I'm not going to lie. Um, and so how can I be more like Naomi and become more selfless and putting my needs a little bit less um, than what God really wants to have happen? That's what I'm going to think about this week. 
Okay, I hope you have a fantastic week this week studying the stories of Ruth and Naomi, and then also the story of Hannah and Samuel and Eli as well. Fantastic stories to study this week. Okay, good luck. Let me know if you have any questions. Make sure to watch this on YouTube or on Instagram, um, and then comment and share. That always helps get this word out to even more people. And don't forget to listen to the One Minute Scripture Study podcast as well. Okay, happy studying.